Hello everyone and welcome back to day 12 of Bitwise where we code a complete software hardware stack for a simple computer from scratch. Um, last day, day 11, um, we in the mainstream we worked on, let's see, what, what did we do in the mainstream? That, I'm trying to remember what we started doing there and what we started doing in the extra stream. I think one thing we did was we, we set up a very simple kind of file-based workflow. So previously we had just been working with, you know, strings and um, and we put in some very basic um, kind of file-based workflows. Let's just probably enable this. I'm just testing some other stuff. Um, where you know you can specify like an ion file. I can demo that right here. Um, and um, you know it will it will do the compilation to the C file, and, and you can look at the C output here. Um, I, I know we did that. I can't remember what we did after that. I think maybe before I closed off the stream, I, um, oh yeah, I think we added some very basic line numbers to the, at least some of the syntax, syntax errors. Um, still haven't updated all of the uh, error messages to, to properly provide a, um, um, like a, a file name and a line number, but uh, simple things definitely do uh, handle properly now. Like if I, Intentionally misspell this. Um, oops. Um, you can see you get that uh, you get that file name and the error number, and uh, that that's done not just in the parser, but also at least for very limited cases. Like um, if I misspell one of these type names. Okay, that one's not what I wanted. Again, we haven't fixed up all the stuff in the resolver, but at least as an example, we did a, a few error messages in there now that uh, we attach uh, source information, source position information to the AST nodes. You can use that to localize errors and report them in that context, but there's still a bunch of stuff that doesn't have that. But anyway, that was some of the stuff we did on the mainstream. And I think uh, right before we uh, we shut off the mainstream and moved to the extra stream, um, I think we noted that things were like slow. Uh, because I think, I think I did this on the mainstream too. I did this very simple test generation script, which just took our existing little test program and just parameterized some of the identifiers so that we could easily um, generate very large programs that are essentially concatenating, um, you know, concatenating copies of this thing, but with different identifiers. Uh, and so if you look at uh, test three, which is the result of running this, you can see there's example test zero and so on. So um, you can use it to generate very large programs. So I think we did that in the mainstream. And then we noted before shutting off that, you know, hey, if you run this on large programs, it's really slow. And I can't remember if I ran the profiler on the mainstream or not, but in any case, uh, it turned out to be the obvious thing, which was that all the linear searches we had been doing, notably for the string interning, um, you know, have quadratic scaling. So if you have a program with a lot of identifiers, which is most programs uh, that are large in general, um, each lookup takes linear time, but because, well, if there's also, especially with a program like this, where there's a lot of top level identifiers, or actually even for interning, that doesn't matter. If there's a lot of unique identifiers, let's say, in which, in, in this case, there are, right? Because each instance of this template, you get, you know, however many of these uh, question marks there are, like basically for each of these top level question mark things, you get a new identifier. And so, you know, running a program like this, you get, you know, you get like a lot, <laughs> you get a lot of identifiers at the top level and each of them, so each, and each of them creates a, an, an, an entry in this linear array. And then every time you see one, you have to go through that linear array. And in fact, every character of each string in that linear array in order to see whether that new identifier actually matches something you've seen before or is a new thing. So overall it has quadratic scaling. And so if you have even a thousand of those, it takes on the order of a million operations to do that. If you have a million of those, oh boy, now you're in real trouble. That's basically never going to finish. Um, and so I think we noted basically that, you know, expected slow scaling, because that was always something we, we knew we had to return to. And, uh, I had just been kind of saving that optimization opportunity for a, uh, for a rainy day. So it was kind of some low hanging fruit. And so in the, um, in the, uh, extra stream, what we basically did was, um, we, uh, we did the profiling and let me just show you how the profiling works. If you didn't see it, um, 
you obviously won't be able to see the exact same thing, thing we saw at the time, unless I rewind the Git repo, which I'm not gonna. Um, but, you know, so yesterday I was looking a little bit at just a, the, the Lexer and parser performance. So I'm just gonna stub out all this other stuff. Um, and if you, I think right now I am set to run, yeah, with this huge test three, test three dot ion file. And this file is, uh, it's a roughly a hundred megabyte file, or sorry, this is the wrong one. It's roughly a hundred mega, it's 90 megabytes, but unless I'm totally, yeah, roughly 90 megabytes. So it's a pretty big file. It's pro well, let's see how many lines it has just to put it into. So that's six million lines of code, I guess. Yeah, six million lines of code. So obviously much larger than anything we'll be dealing with, but just a good way to stress something, I guess, to, to get enough samples for the profiler to work with. Um, and so, yeah, let's try, well, first let's just try running it um, and see how long it takes. I think it's roughly like, oh, so this is just the parsing. The parsing I think takes 1.7 seconds when I timed it. So it's like less than two seconds. So that's pretty good. Um, that's not generating any output, but it is parsing. It's not type checking or type resolving or anything, but it is lexing and parsing. And so 100 megabytes in, uh, in that time is not terrible. Um, but let's see where the time is being spent by um, just running the same test, but now with Profiler. And uh, I can't remember if I did this on the the, the mainstream, so I'll just quickly go over how to read this kind of profile. Uh, first off, let me just make a quick note on how this kind of thing works without going into a ton of detail. Uh, the way this profiler works is called sampling um, or statistical profiling. And the idea is um, at regular intervals, for, and typically I think the default sampling rate is a thousand times a second, so one kilohertz, um, uh, you know, so which is, which is every... Uh, every millisecond, basically, every millisecond when you're profiling, the OS is going to um, is going to temporarily pause the program as it's running, and for each of the threads, and in this case, there's only really run one thread that that matters. It's going to take a snapshot of the call stack. So, you know, if you imagine, actually, let me show you sort of a really poor man's profiling approach. It doesn't really work for this stuff, but you know, imagine you're running something and you press. Uh, and you press the pause button, or, you know, you, you break at some, you know, you run a program. In this case, it runs for two seconds, but I just break, you know, shortly after it starts manually. And you can see here, we find ourselves in the stir intern range. Um, and this is maybe not running long enough for, uh, for that. But if you do it again, um, now we're in that allocator. If we do it again, we find ourselves in the hash table. If you do it again, we're in the hash table again. Let's try it a few more times just to make my point about the statistical sampling. Okay, here we're you know somewhere in the parser, um, but not in some leaf function. Let's try it again. Okay, now we're in the system allocator. Let's try it again. Now we're in the next token function doing some kind of dispatching. Let's try it again. Here we're in the map put function. This is for the hash table. So the point I'm trying to make is that um, this is not how you would normally do it, obviously. It's not a very effective way of doing statistical sampling profiling. But essentially, the system is doing the equivalent of this, but much more efficiently at a, at a much higher rate, which is you know, a thousand times a second, uh, stopping the program sort of very briefly. And you can see when we're stopped here, we don't, we don't just know the line we're on. We actually know the whole call stack. And so it takes a, a snapshot of the whole call stack um, not not the data in the call stack, but just what you know, what instruction pointers, uh, you know, what places in those functions on the call stack we were in, and then basically it says, well, um, we can't know for sure what what the program was doing between those sample points for you know those one millisecond intervals, but we're going to assume that the samples we took are roughly representative, and so every time if you're sampling at a, a thousand times a second. Um, if we find ourselves, for example, in this map put function over a given second, we find ourselves 10 times out of a thousand possible. We're going to say that's we're going to ascribe 10 milliseconds of work to map put, and of course that's a statistical estimate. 
um, and it can make mistakes. Like you can be very unlucky and something that actually takes 90% of the CPU time, uh, even though you're sampling uh, a thousand times a second, you could be extremely rare and you're always hitting those 10% cases where um, where you're not in that function that's, that's actually the 90% hotspot. But as you take more samples, it becomes increasingly unlikely, assuming some kind of uniform, you know, some independent uh, random sampling. And so that's kind of the the logic behind sampling as a way of uh, of doing profiling. The 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 really nice thing about sampling is that it's extremely it's it's quite efficient. So a thousand times a second is um, in terms of the overhead it introduces into the running of the program and the system in general. It's it's you know in the low percentages typically. Um, it's not very expensive, and um, so you can do it. You can run this kind of thing without seriously perturbing the workload. Whereas there are things uh, that might be the more obvious way to do it if if you've never heard of statistical profiling, called uh, instrumentation-based profiling, where basically you know you add when you're either in the compiler when you're generating the machine code or maybe after the fact uh, instrumenting an existing binary, you add some sort of measurement instructions. Uh, and, and the most obvious things might, might be to every time you enter a function, you record what you know what the, the timestamp counter was for the CPU. And then when you exit, you, you look at it again and you say, well, the difference between the entry and the exit must be how much time I spent in the function. And then the, you record you record things that way. And um, that can be very useful too, especially if you're doing manual profiling and you want to do it for a few sort of big functions. Um, but it, it, it doesn't give you line level information. And so if you want line level profiling information, you would have to add even more of those counters at a very fine grain. And that starts to really become expensive in terms of the overhead. Um, and also, you know, uh, if you're really trying to do hotspot profiling or what you care about are the heavy hitters, like the things that are taking you know, 10% of the CPU time or something like that. Um, statistically, you just don't need to do that kind of fine-grained counting. You can just do statistical profiling. And if for whatever reason you're trying to find, you know, for example, if you're sampling um, a thousand times a second and you have um, and you have a transient, there's some transient code that only runs for uh, one tenth of a second, but you really care about it. You can you can sometimes temp, you can for a specific pr profile run you can increase the sampling rate to try to focus on that, or you can artificially take that part of the workload and you can run it many times in order for, to, for it to show up statistically more often, so that even sampling at say a thousand hertz a second or a hundred hertz, um, not a thousand hertz a second that's meaningless a thousand hertz, so that so that the thing you're trying to suss out actually will show up with the statistical sampling approach. But basically. Um, for this kind of automated profiling, statistical, the statistical sampling approach is what everyone uses. So anyway, just a bit of background on that. Let's go back to this profile now with that in mind. So you can see here, it's um, based on all these samples of call stacks, it describes uh, total CPU time and what it calls self-CPU time. In, in other profilers, this is sometimes called the inclusive time uh, for this total CPU column, and this over here is called the exclusive time. So um, inclusive or total CPU time refers to everything that was done in the function itself and as a result of other functions that it may have called. So in our case, you can see that, you know, main, of course, is our entry point. So not surprisingly, basically everything can ultimately be ascribed to it. But main itself, I mean, main itself doesn't do anything. So so being told that main is ultimately responsible for, you know, 97% of the CPU time is almost empty information. Um, th this kind of Info can sometimes be useful if you have, say, three functions corresponding to three major parts of the compiler, uh, in our case, and you just want to get an overview of like, um, hey, how long is the parsing taking versus the code generation? Um, but, um, but in general, the most useful information tends to be when you're looking at things bottom up instead. Um, and so when you're looking at things bottom up, you're looking at the, the work, the CPU time that can be just directly ascribed to the function rather than any other function it may have called. Um, and so let's look at some examples. For example, if you look at mapget here, um, mapget, it, it does call some other functions, but these are almost, um, this stuff is inlined. Um, this is going to be inlined. So, um, but you can see most of the time for this function, is is here and this is by the way when it when it says eight percent um 
this means eight, not 8% 8 of this function, but 8% of the total profile run. So 8.75% 8, 8 of whatever, um, we, I think this, this test ran for you know around two seconds. So you can kind of do the math there. That's roughly um, what this accounts for. Um, so you can see a lot of the time was spent just doing this lookup. And um, I guess the thing that's notable is that this is not really doing anything like it's not doing any it, it doesn't look very heavy right but this is going to be uh, in many cases a random access lookup to memory and so once once the map is really large like in our case it probably has like a million entries um this thing here is going to uh you know cash miss you know very likely l1 in many cases and maybe maybe even some of the higher levels of the, of the memory hierarchy um, but yeah, so you can see how that works. So you can quickly, by, by taking this kind of bottom-up self-CPU or exclusive time view, you can kind of see where, where the actual work is being done that's eating the time. Uh, and so you can see in our case, this is just looking at the parsing and lexing. Um, the, the, I guess the thing, that, the thing that really stand out here are uh, actually malloc. And so if you, and this is the system allocator. So this is some of the system malloc stuff we haven't actually uh, removed yet and um, and so when you click on it you can't see the source code like we could for some of our own functions but you can see the call stacks so you can see this is the bottom of the call stack um, and you can see the things that called it and what percentage of, of you know and and how how big those were overall in terms of the total CPU time um, and so you know the fact that ion compile file indirectly called it is not really useful information but the stuff that's maybe more relevant is that you can see our arena allocator only called it six times, which is expected because the arena allocator allocates in one megabyte chunks. And so even though it's doing big allocations, it's not doing very many of them, but this thing here is doing quite, quite a number of them. Um, and that's accounting for, uh, for, for, uh, for, for, I guess, the bulk. And if you look at where these buff grow things are coming from, um, this is, again, something that we... Uh, at least I think I mentioned that we would be replacing it eventually, but it's coming from this buff grow for a stretchy buff. But then in turn, this is coming from um, from things like parse statement block, where we have these temporary stretchy buffs. We used to accumulate the list of statements in the statement block before we finally hand it off to the AST, where the AST is going to do its own arena-based allocation. So um, we could get rid of all this overhead very quickly, which... I mean, maybe not all of it, right? Like we couldn't necessarily drive drive this number to zero, but we could probably get it very close to zero. Um, and so I thought that would be a good place to start. Actually, before we go into that, let me cover, that was sort of a tangent, but let, let, let's make that our first to-do item for today to actually get this down to close to zero. But uh, I, I did want to cover some of the stuff we, we, we did in the extra stream before moving to that. So yeah, we did profiling um, and the things we we optimized was, like I said, principally removing the linear searches. And we did that by moving to a hash table rather than a linear array search. And so um, I'm not going to go into a ton of detail. I'm just going to make some, 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 I guess, some observations on the design. It's a very standard uh, hash table. But so this is, um, this is the standard kind of hash table I write when I just want something really simple. You can see it's, what is it, uh, 317 to, yeah, so it's, it's, it's a little more than 50 lines of code. It's a pretty small hash table. It doesn't support deletions. It only has two real operations, uh, which is get and put. And um, rather than supporting kind of arbitrary value types sort of in line, it works with um, it works with pointer size data. So you, you, you would normally think of this as a pointer hash table. Uh, both the keys and the values are treated as void stars. They're just you know pointers. But really, and we'll, we exploit this for the string interning, uh, it doesn't really care about whether the pointer points to anything. It just really cares about the fact that it's a pointer sized piece of data because it's just going to treat it as a bunch of bits for the sake of, of doing these lookups. Um, and so the style of hash table we're using is called an open addressed hash table. Um, and I'm not going to go into a whole spiel about that, um, but I recommend you look at the Wikipedia article for open addressing. Um, the th it might differ from what you've seen before if you've only seen so-called externally chained hash tables. 
With uh, externally chained hash tables, what you have is you have a big array of things. And so when you hash your key, you get an index into that array. And then each slot in the array is basically a pointer to a linked list of all the elements that hashed to that slot. Um, and um, that's not how I do things. This, that's not how most people do things uh, who care about performance. Uh, instead, you do um, this thing here, which is called open addressing. And the idea is that the data is, the data is stored directly in the table. And when you have collisions, rather than externally chaining the collided elements, you, um, you just put them after each. Well, I'm using what's called linear probing. So with linear probing, if I hash to slot 5 and someone already took my slot, I'm then going to look at slot 6. Uh, after it subsequently, uh, and and if and if I and if that slot is not if that slot is empty, I'm going to go in slot six, and then when I eventually do my lookup, I'm first going to check slot five, and I'm going to say, well, um, slot five, do you have the key I'm looking for? And if not, I'm going to look at the next slot, and uh, eventually, I'm either going to find my element, or I'm going to find an empty slot, um, because we have this invariant that the length of the table, which is the number of occupied slots, is always less than the total capacity, which means that Anytime you do a probe, um, you're always eventually going to hit an empty slot that serves as a sentinel that stops the search. So that's why this seemingly infinite loop is actually terminating, because we ensure that um, we never fill it up completely. So there's always going to be at least one sentinel, one sentinel empty slot that will stop the search. Um, but that's linear probing. Um, and uh, the, the, the great thing about this approach is that with hashing, you want to optimize for for what you can call a hole in one, which is that the first slot you look in is going to be the one you're actually looking for, um, and um, you can you can get you know you can't get that all the time, but you can get that a surprising majority of the time. And with open addressing, uh, you don't have to then you, you know for optimizing for that case of a hole in one. The, the data you're looking for is, is right there in the slot when you go and look. You don't have to then go and, and look at some uh, externally chained linked list. Um, so uh, this is, even if you're looking at totally random data, uh, this is optimizing essentially for, for the case where you only get one cache miss because the first, you know, the first random access hash lookup is, you know, it's pretty random typically if the hash function is any good. Um, uh, although if you're looking up the same keys over and over, those those cache lines are going to stay in cache uh, because of temporal locality. But uh, you're basically optimizing for that case of, of a hole in one and making sure that is only at most one cache hit, uh, cache miss at most. Um, and so that's kind of the idea there. And we, like I said, um, we yeah. So we, we prevent the infinite loop by making sure the length is less than the capacity. Uh, and we also when we grow the table, we always make sure that the uh, that the load factor is never more than 50%. So we never allow the number of occupied slots to uh, occupy more than 50% of the table, and that ensure that that's what helps us keep down, you know, kind of ensure that the hole in one case, or just in general, if not quite a hole in one, at least that the the number of additional probes we have to do after the first one is is fairly small in practice. Um, and so, yeah, um, feel free to look at this code if you haven't seen it before, but it's pretty simple. Um, I make a bunch of simplifying assumptions that you might not be able to make in a completely general purpose hash table. So for example, I assume that I can use a, a zero value for the key as a sentinel uh, to signify an empty slot, um, which means that you can't use a null pointer or if you're using a non-pointer value cast to avoid a pointer, uh, you can't use the zero value as a meaningful key. So you can see that's asserted here because we use that to signify empty slots. Um, there are ways of handling, if you want to support that case, um, you can you can certainly do so. It requires a little bit of extra code, um, but because in our case, it's totally, we don't need to handle that, we just don't. So this is one of the advantages of just writing something really simple and specific to your problem is that you can you can just exploit these simplifying assumptions. And even, and even if each of them is not like a huge win in complexity or, or code size or whatever, um, they start to add up once you make them everywhere. So yeah, that's one assumption we make. Um, I think that's actually the, oh yeah, the other thing is we, we don't allow deletions. So um, if you want to support deletions, you not only need to have a sentinel value um, for empty slots, but you also need to have a sentinel value for deleted slots, usually called tombstones or broken hearts. 
And aside from preserving yet another Sentinel value for those, you also need to prevent the case. I mean, again, it's not super difficult, but you need to have some heuristic for um, for rehashing the table when you get too many tombstones, because once you have tombstones, they're essentially dead space. They're making all the probe probe sequences longer than they should be and so on and, and none of that is difficult to handle um, but it's just like it's one more thing you have to handle and the way we're using hash tables we never have to delete stuff uh, we always just do append only right like they they start empty and they grow over time but and eventually maybe we, we delete them and recreate them but we're never really uh, sort of incrementally deleting things and so we don't have to deal with that and that makes it you know marginally simpler um, and let's see um, another small design choice is that I split out the key array and the values array, which means that if you do have to, um, I guess this actually, mm, this actually means that we have two cache misses, uh, if, if we have a hole in one. So it's maybe, maybe I should move back to my original of, of co-locating keys and values, but anyway, you can, you can do it this way, which speeds things up if you're probing more than one element by a little bit, because um, you don't have, you know, if the first key you check is not the one you want and the value for that first key is right next to it, now you have to skip over it. And so it's sort of polluting the cache with data that's not relevant if you're not uh, hitting a hole in, hole in one. Um, so, so maybe this is actually a pessimization for, for the way we're uh, setting the, the load factor to 50%. But anyway, um, I, uh, I had a fun link uh, for today, which I recommend you read. It's from Sean Barrett. And... Um, um, if you've never seen a hash table before, this is not going to um, make sense, I guess. Um, but uh, I recommend you, this is like a, a really old article, but uh, this was, I remember reading this around maybe a year after it came out and it kind of changed my view a lot on on how high, on how, how efficient simple hash tables can be. Um, and uh, he compares hash tables, like a very simple 200 line hash table that he wrote for the occasion, to something that's called Judy arrays, which is this big, very complicated adaptive data structure, which, you know, they implemented. I mean, it's almost like a straw man of itself because they took 20,000 lines of code to implement basically a single adaptive data structure. Um, even if you're taking that general approach, there's things like libart, which, um, which do a much better job of of hitting the right point on the power to weight uh, ratio. Um, but anyway, he kind of compares um, compares a simple hash table to Judy arrays. And, um, you know, basically for, for a lot of cases, uh, hash tables are very competitive or even superior, even though they're less spatially compact. Um, and so anyway, I recommend you check out this page. And he also has some code here somewhere. Um, oh, not Visual Studio Code. Okay, I guess Sublime is not there. Okay, let's just use let's just use Notepad. Notepad is awesome. Let's not use Notepad. Um, yeah. So uh, I think it's like a two hundred line table. And it's more sophisticated than mine. Like for example, it does something called double hashing rather than linear uh, probing or what is it? I guess, yeah, it is called double hashing. Um, and with double hashing, you rather than using sort of a, a constant stride where you go, you know, you check the first element and if that's not the, if that's already occupied, you still get the next one. It actually uses a stride that's also hashed. Um, and so it, it, it reduces heavily what's called secondary clustering. Um, but, uh, one of the advantages of linear probing is that it's cache coherent in a spatial sense, because after the first slot, you check an immediately adjacent shot, slot and so on. And so even though it has worse, worse secondary clustering, it's slightly better in terms of, of cache coherent, uh, of cache coherent access. Um, but, uh, th this is worth checking out as a. Uh, since he has an actual performance analysis in that paper comparing it to Judy Arrays, and he does handle uh, deletions. So if you want to see one way of handling deletions, you can see how he does it here. Um, 
he uses for dealing with the sentinels one cool trick he has is in the uh in the big array itself he does use i think zero and one yeah zero he does use zero and one as the empty and deleted sentinels um, but then since he can't store those keys in the value itself he has this little overflow table um which you know contains if there's actual keys equal to zero or one those are just stored in this little overflow array here um, so anyway um, check that out if you're interested in more of this sort of thing all right so um, that was the first tool we, we built now the original hotspot we were trying to kill was string interning but string interning is not directly at least a pointer hash table it's like a string hash table because you're trying to map from the string you saw in the token st stream to whatever intern table entry uh, is associated with that. So there's an additional trick that I use here, which is a form of external chaining. Um, and basically what it is, is I have, a, um, I have a string hash function here. And it's basically, I think this is just an F and B hash with some additional, a little bit of additional rotational mixing, which may even be unnecessary. Um, but it's a string hash, so you pass in a substring and it does a you know a basic hash of it here. And essentially, the way you can think of this is it reduces a you know it reduces a string to a 64-bit value in a way that's hopefully kind of well distributed, so that if you have two strings, for example, that differ by a single character, like for example, um, if you have foo one and foo zero, uh, or and maybe a lot a lot of foos. Like suppose you have like I mean, this is kind of a pathological case, but imagine you have a million identifiers that all start with the uh, with foo. Uh, if you have things like that that are quite similar, like they have a common prefix or whatever, you want them to be widely distributed by the hash function. So even though they're similar in the in initial representation, once you hash them, you want them to be sort of scattered in a pseudo-random fashion across the 64-bit range uh, of this domain. And um, and so the way we we do string interning is we get our substring. We hash it to one of these 64-bit keys in a way that's hopefully looks like a, a lot like a random number. Oh, and this thing here. Hopefully, I didn't check this in. This was just for a, a test I did. Um, and um, then, given that string hash, so that compresses an arbitrary length string down to 64 bits of hopefully sort of crunchy data that's nicely pseudo-random and distributed. Uh, we turn that into a key, which is a pointer, right? So we're just casting this to um, to this opaque pointer that represents her hash. Uh, and you can see there's one special case here because the pointer hash table doesn't allow you to use zero keys. Um, if you randomly from the hash function get a zero, I just force it to be one, which is it's not a problem. Uh, it just reduces, you know, from two, it, it just means that our a number of possible keys or the number of possible results of this function effectively drop from two to the 64 to two to the 64 minus one. So it doesn't really change the statistical distribution in a meaningful way. But anyway, then once we have this key that's kind of the compressed, the string compressed down to 64 bits, we can then use that as a key in the hash table. And so the hash table is internally using open addressing and linear probing. Um, but the thing we're now storing in the table is a pointer to an intern entry. And so um, compared to before, one difference is that we're now storing the character data for an intern string in line rather than as a separate string. Um, and so an intern entry now has the length as before, and now it has an inline string buffer. So um, similar to the way our stretchy buffs work, we have a, a fixed size header, and then we have a variable length tail that contains the payload data. Um, and then we also have this next pointer, which um, is going to be used to point to any potential chain of other intern strings that happen to have the same 64-bit string hash. And it will turn out um, for probability theory reasons that even, even with millions of strings, if you have a good string hash function, you're essentially never gonna get external chaining collisions. Because um, unlike the normal case in a hash table where you're taking, for example, a 64-bit hash and then you're reducing it to essentially the size of the hash table uh, the, the hash table capacity so if you have a even if you start with a 64-bit hash if you crunch it down to say eight bits for a 256 capacity table you know you started with 64 bits but now you're down to eight bits and so you can easily have a lot of collisions at that level um, but here, the thing we're actually the thing we have to consider for collisions is not that reduced range; it's the full 64-bit range, and you can take it on, well, you can take it maybe on faith that 
if you've heard of the birthday paradox or the birthday problem, that um, you know roughly if you have um, if you have something like let's see what is it if you have n possible um, let's see I mean this is probably a butchering if you have n po let's see if you have n possible slots um, and square root n um, values um, then um, high probability of no collisions uh, let's say random values uniformly distributed uniform iid this is um independent like what is it what's the first one in identically distributed independent uh random values then high, prob high probability of no collisions at all and so that's kind of what we're using here essentially we would need to have on the order of for 64 bit uh, good 64-bit hashes, you would need to have on the order of 4 billion strings before you start expecting collisions in this sense. So basically, we're almost never going to have collisions, and this external chaining stuff is really just for freak accidents or when the hash function is worse than expected or something like that. Um, but other than that, um, we're, we essentially do the same thing as before. Now we're just searching a, a vastly reduced search space. Uh, this before was this loop previously was searching through all of the intern strings, but now it's only searching through the strings that happen to get the same 64-bit hash value. And so, um, th this is a, a, a pretty st like a, a pretty reusable technique for using a pointer hash table compared with a byte stream hash function, like something that could take a, a variable length thing and crunch it down to say a 64-bit key. Using that in combination with a pointer hash table. Um, in order to build more general hash tables, in this case on string data. So a uh, very simple technique that you can kind of deploy. So, so basically what this means is we don't need to have a dedicated string hash table data structure. We can just combine a string hash function with a pointer ha uh, hash table and this kind of chain search, and we're good anyway. But other than that, it's basically the same stuff as before with the small caveat that we're now allocating the string data in line uh, as a tail, kind of like we were doing, if you remember the stretchy buffs, um, we had the same kind of thing here where we have a fixed a fixed length header and then a variable length tail that contains the payload, and that's the same thing we're doing here, basically. All right. Um, and so when we implemented this, uh, the profile, everything sped up, you know, everything was now linear time rather than quadratic time, so not only was it a con big constant factor speed up, for any particular file, but but it also meant that we can now scale to very large files. Um, and so, for example, previously, uh, when I tried to when I tried to run on one of these hundred megabyte files, like it would literally it would never have finished, right? Because it would have been it it would have taken I don't know if there's a million things and you know it's ten to the twelve operate on the order of ten to the twelve operations or something like that. It would it would it would almost run forever. Um, and so now it ran sort of fairly fast. Um, so anyway, that was it for string hashing. After string hashing, um, the next bottleneck was in the symbol table. And so you can you probably recall that we had this thing called global sims. Um, let's see here. Why is it doing that? Um, global sims. And previously, global sims was a was a stretchy buff. So it was a big stretchy buff. And when we did simget, um, well, we always we're still doing this local kind of stack style search of the local sims because that's always a small set of symbols, and the fact that it's a stack makes it very easy for us to incrementally push and pop things. Um, but previously in this section of the code, after if the local sims lookup failed, we would go through and do a linear search on the global sims and the stretchy buffer. So this was another big linear search, and um, it wasn't quite as slow as the intern string search and probably the big reason is just that with the intern search you were also doing actual string comparisons and stuff like that and there were probably even though there's an early out based on the string length a lot of things probably had the same length and so you're doing a lot of of, uh, of byte by byte comparisons of the actual strings um, but now we just do um, uh, but but it was still there and, and in particular after we removed the intern hotspot uh, the hotspot moved to simget and uh, but now that we we have this hash table, this was basically the only change we needed to make. We now just do a uh, a hash table lookup here. 
um, and it directly gives us what, what we want. So the hash table maps interned string pointers to simple pointers. That's the idea. And uh, there's a simput function, I think. What is it called? Simput? Global put. Yeah, sim global put, which just calls map put on the global sims and associates the name with the symbol. So that was, I think, the other big hot spot we optimized using hash tables. Um, trying to remember if we did anything after that. Or was that the last thing? Um, oh, yeah, there was one more hash table optimization. Uh, we still had, and we still have, actually, some um, some linear searches for some of these caches, which is another form of interning, right? So we had string interning, and here we have type interning. And you can actually see what it looked like before, because I think we still have an example for, I guess, maybe for arrays. Although arrays are a little bit different, since there's two elements in the key rather than just one. But basically, even for this type putter function, we previously had... Um, we previously had this kind of big linear search in the cache, um, and now we just use a ha and and so this function was showing up in the profile because apparently the resolver was spending a lot of time calling this and each of and I guess because again this was maybe not particularly realistic um, in terms of real workloads, but because we had this top level template replicated again and again, there was a lot of unique. I mean, there's a lot of like, let's see here, like T star right. Um, and there's a, a lot of unique types, like there's an instance of this T thing and uh, the union and the vector for every instance of the template. And so there were a lot of different uh, types to search through in this big, uh, in this uh, cast putter types array. It used to be an array. And so anyway, we just moved that to a pointer hash table. And now it's directly indexed on the type element pointer. And, um, and then that hotspot went away as well. So that was basically three... All the three major hotspots um, that were sort of easily fixable, um, and we just made some, you know, we just used this hash table and plopped it in, and it, and it, uh, it sped things up tremendously. So, all right. Um, let me actually show you. So, when we were running this profile before, I was just doing the parsing. Let me re enable everything else, and uh, let me show you. Um, First, let's just run it to make sure it still works because I I was screwing around with stuff yesterday. So let me just make sure it works first. Um, yeah, so it probably doesn't work. What did I change? That's annoying. Um, well, let's just debug it. So what does it say here? You got a null. So this value I is okay. This is too big to really. Okay, and I has been I has, it looks like I has been optimized out, which is weird. But all right. Um so I don't really know which one that was. But yeah, this is null somehow. Hmm. Let me just try something here. Let's uh, regenerate the test because it, it will probably occur. Actually, even with test one, it should occur because that's the same thing, just not replicated a million times. Okay, that works. It's annoying. Um, Okay, let's try. Um, let's do something much smaller, like maybe two.
Okay, that failed. Um, probably even with one, right? Presumably. So that seemed to work. Okay. So maybe it's some sort of symbol collision issue. Okay. So presumably the issue is actually in here. Um, Let's just put this back on debug so we can actually get some useful. Hopefully it still occurs in debug. This looks like uninitialized memory. What did I do? Um, boom, boom, boom. Let me just look at the diff because I don't think this was happening before. Sorry about that. I this is what I get for screwing with stuff before the stream. Um, doesn't look like an issue. Oh, did I screw around with this? Yeah, that must be it. That was definitely. All right. Probably just shouldn't have screwed around with that. I was doing some stuff slightly in anticipation of something we were maybe doing. Um, actually, let me just revert that one because there's nothing else in that file I care about. Um, too many windows. Okay. Okay, that was. I forgot I started that and didn't finish it. So um, let's see here. Let's crank that back up. Ping. Oh yeah, I have to change it. All right, we'll see if this works. It should take like seven seconds. So this is now running the full compilation pipeline, like generating the C code and stuff. Um, yeah, so I think it's roughly seven seconds. Let's now try to do a profile run on that. Uh, while I'm waiting for this, someone's uh, mentioning something about hashing and randomization. When I say randomization, I don't mean true randomness. I just mean that things are distributed in a way that is characteristic of random numbers. So for example, suppose that, um, so, so we're using a power of two hash table, right? Um, suppose that I was directly using the pointer values that are the keys. Suppose I was directly using the pointer values modulo the table size as the, uh, as the hash value. So that would be pretty non-random. It would just be like a modulo of the table size. 
Um, and it, so it basically used the, the direct input data without any kind of weird mixing. Um, in that case, that's a good example of why it's dangerous to use data directly uh, with, without scrambling it in some way. Uh, because in that case, suppose the pointers you get in are like eight, eight byte aligned, which, you know, if you call malloc, for example, they're at least going to be eight byte aligned, probably 16 byte aligned. Um, which means that if you take a, you know, a 16 byte, 16 byte aligned pointer, it means the four lowest bits of the address are zero. And so if you take that modulo, modulo a power of two, the resulting number still has the lower four bits equal to zero, which means that you're only ever landing in hash buckets that have an index divisible by 16, which means that you're using at most 1 16th of the capacity of the table. And so that's the kind of thing you want to avoid. You want to make sure that even if you have values that have some kind of initial structure, like in this case, they are all 16 byte aligned uh, numbers. Um, once you're done hashing them, you want any, any kind of similarity or structure like that to be kind of scrambled and dis, you know, disassociated uh, in a way that's characteristic of random numbers, basically. So a lot of the analysis of hashing, in, 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 you know, in both in theory and practice, relies on distributions that have some aspects of randomness in terms of their distribution. But it doesn't mean that things are actually random. Although there is something called universal hashing or keyed hashing, um, where at, at startup you actually generate a random salt or a random seed um, to so that the hash function in every run of your program is, is going to be different and it can make it harder for uh, attackers to do denial of service attacks and so on by flooding certain elements of a, of a hash uh, table uh, to, to induce kind of uh, linear time search rather than a constant time search. But anyway, so when I say randomness, I basically mean you want a hash function that has this sort of mixing or scrambling property that makes the numbers, even if they have a lot of initial structure like having certain prefixes of their strings in common or in you know in the case of the pointers being aligned to a certain boundary you want that structure to be kind of scrambled uh, by the time you are done with them with a the hasher so that they're kind of nicely spread evenly across the table so that's the idea all right um, so anyway so we did this profile run now not just with the and parser that we saw before but with everything and so um, what you'll see in this profile is that the string and turning is still up here, right? So it's still like, you know, 3% of the overall runtime, but it's very insignificant in the grand scheme of things. The stuff that actually takes a lot of time is, um, well, the big kahuna is this, uh, the system uh, vsprintf function. And so if you look at where that's being called, it's being called by, well, two principal sources, strf, which is our, um, is the function we use when generating um, uh, C-type declarations. And uh, the other one is, um, and, and even more so, is buff printf, which we use uh, for you know, concatenating all the different strings that, we, um, that, that ultimately constitute the, the C output. And so let's see here. What are the... Yeah, so for example, I mean, again, and this is maybe not representative exactly, like exactly what distribution of these functions are responsible for it is maybe not totally representative of, of a real workload because we have a lot of, of top level declarations with fairly small function bodies. So you can see that um, genfunc.decl is going to both generate the Ford declaration of a given function, but also the actual declaration. And so you know, and the function bodies are very small, so the ratio of function body to to the declaration of the function is maybe unrealistic. Um, but you know, in general, you can see that there's a lot of this going on. Um, and uh, one way you can kind of eyeball this stuff is to say that um, if we're sampling a thousand times a second, which I believe is the sampling rate for this, then if something is like you know 2.78. Uh, a thousand samples, it should roughly correspond to 2.7 seconds worth of CPU time. And again, this is a statistical uh, estimate, but uh, that that is about right. So this is, if you look at the C file that's generated, um, it's 100 megabytes. So the input file is about 90 megabytes and the output is about 
uh, 100. And the, the reason for the extra 10 megabytes or extra 10% roughly is just because of the four declarations, which right now are generated indiscriminately. Um, but, you know, so despite the fact that the syntaxes are more or less one to one, there's that extra 10% overhead for the four declarations. But anyway, so you can see buff sprintf is spending roughly 2.7 seconds um, to generate 100 megabytes of data, which is pretty bad, to be honest. 100 megabytes of data is nothing for a computer. Um, so this is a little bit disappointing, and most of the time can be ascribed to, to just calling into the system's uh, sprintf uh, implementation. So that's a little bit disappointing. Um, there's there's definitely things you could do to speed this up. For example, right now, almost everything we're doing, I mean, and I, I'm not sure how much it would help. So I'm not going to optimize on that today because there's some other low-hanging fruit. But what you'll notice that right now, we're mostly just using um, the stuff. Like we're mostly just, um, what do you want to call it? We're mostly just doing string concatenation. Like we're not really using pound D, pound F or stuff like that. So this would, you know, you could rewrite this to, to just directly print this string and then print this character for the open paren. Like you, you wouldn't have to actually use printf for this. So this would be a way of cutting out, um, cutting out printf um, from the equation for almost all the cases here. Like if you look at almost all, this is just using percent %s and stuff like this is totally not needed. Um, so there's definitely some some simple things you could do here to remove the use of printf. Um, because yeah, we're almost just doing all this string concatenation, and this is mostly a convenience. In theory, all of this could be broken into separate statements that you know generates this string, then this string, then this string. It's just more convenient to have it like this. It's more compact in the code, but it doesn't provide any heavy lifting. So definitely, there's ways to reduce that. Um, and yeah, so so anyway, that that's the the heaviest hitter. After that, though, there's also this, which is pretty big. And uh, interestingly, this malloc here is ascribable to, um, well, the majority is stir f. So remember, stir f is being used to recursively construct these C, C type declarations. And it's doing a lot of really small string allocations. So this is like a really, in my mind, a really obvious candidate for. Um, a really obvious candidate for optimizing to using an arena or even better some sort of stack allocator um, so, so that the kind of thing we we might be, want to do and um, that might give a, a, a decent win um, I'm not necessarily super concerned about that right now partly because um, S print F is kind of dominating so this is really where you should try to focus your attention uh, but I just wanted to show like basically, this is where we ended up on the total compilation pipeline right now. Um, but unfortunately, you know, we've generated a C program. We still have to compile it. Uh, if you try to compile this, I, I, I tried 30 minutes. So how many lines of code is it? Um, both with Emma, Visual Studio and GCC, um, this is this is quote unquote only five million lines of code. Um, but it took more than 20, uh, 30 minutes, and I had to shut it off. And so you know, it takes seven seconds on our side, and I don't know if I hit a pathological case because of the nature of the code, but, you know, seven seconds to 30 minutes is pretty obscene. Um, so from that point of view, there's actually not much point in optimizing this. For the lexer and parser, however, since I plan to use it for for standalone, you know, editor, being able to use it from inside a text editor and from, for doing code formatting and stuff like that. It actually does make sense to me to optimize that a little bit more uh, eventually, but um, but but until we, I mean, like this is the, the ratio of seven seconds to thirty plus minutes is is so skewed that from that point of view, uh, it doesn't make sense to optimize the C code generation, for example, very much. Um, but the, the stuff earlier in the pipeline, like certainly the Lexa plus parser, since it's, you can use it for code formatting, you you want to be able to do parsing, lexing, parsing, and code formatting in less than 10 milliseconds for, say, 10,000 lines of code if it's already in the disk cache, because that's kind of real-time speed. So then you can integrate it into an editor, and it can do instantaneous code formatting. So that stuff is actually worth optimizing, and some of the stuff we did already moved it very close to that performance target. Um, likewise, with the type resolver, uh, if, if you're iterating on code, 
it's very nice if you can get basically instantaneous uh, compile errors, right? Um, and it, that's going to be obviously slower than just parsing it because it's parsing plus the other stuff. But that's also worth making fast. Um, and right now, that stuff is pretty pretty fast because we've you know we fix the simple table lookup being linear time rather than constant time, and we fix the some of the type interning being linear time rather than or rather than constant time. And so all of that stuff is is pretty fast now. So actually, let's let's see if we go back to um, to this stuff here, and so, so suppose we um, we do all of this stuff, but we don't do the generation. How how quick is that? So it's roughly two seconds for the parsing. I would expect this is four seconds. One. I mean, it's let's see. One two, three, four. Yeah, so it's like four seconds in my very scientific approach to measurement. Um, so that's so it's roughly twice as long to do the type resolving as it is to do the lexing and parsing. And so, you know, if we can get, it, let's say that it's 10 milliseconds for a reasonably sized file to um, to parse it, or not, not a file, a package. Let's say you have a package, which, which might constitute multiple files. But let's say it's 10,000 lines of code. And it's 10 milliseconds to parse it. Let's say it's 20 milliseconds to parse it and to type check it. That's still within the bounds of what you can do basically in real time in an editor setting. So uh, th that's not too bad. Anyway, sorry. So that was kind of a rambling, uh, a rambling walkthrough of the stuff we did and what other things might be useful or not useful to do in the future. My, my sense right now is that all the stuff that's related to C code generation per se even though it's sort of obscenely slow how VS printf behaves, it doesn't really make sense um, to optimize it because it's you only want to do the C code generation when you're actually calling the C compiler, and the C compiler is like orders of magnitude slower than us. And so that even though that makes makes my it, it hurts my brain that VS printf is that slow, there's not much of a point in optimizing it. So let's optimize for convenience for ourselves instead, so we can use printf uh, you know as a convenience. Um, but then for the parser, uh, since I knew that today was mostly going to be a walkthrough, we're already one hour in, uh, and I haven't written any new code. Um, I thought the one thing we would do in the parser that was in the profile um, was to um, was to remove some of the temp allocations for the t for the stretchy buffers, since those were on top of the profile. So let's just go back to that and remind ourselves what that looked like. Um, so this is just doing the parsing. It's like two seconds ish. Oh no. Yeah, roughly two seconds, I think, right? Um, and so let's do a profile run just to remind ourselves of what that was. All right. Um, Uh, sorry, it's just spacing out. So yeah, so uh, remember, almost 30% was in malloc base, and almost all of that came. Well, actually, not all of that. So wh wh where is this coming from? That's, uh, let me just look at that. That's su surprising. So. Why is it? Is there a more detailed report I need here? Um, oh, sorry. This this here is confusing. That's not. I was looking at the wrong thing, right? So so this is basically. Yeah, sorry. I was misreading the percentages. Um, Right, so you can see out of the 448 times that malloc was called, 440 was here and 23 were, was here. This is actually not that many in the grand scheme of things. I mean, 40, well, there. sorry, it's not 440 calls, it's 440 milliseconds. I'm, I'm being stupid. Um, so anyway, yeah, let's, uh, let, let's again remind ourselves of where that came from. So buff grow, this is for the stretchy buffers. And um, let's see, 447. It looks like essentially, right, 
like parse decal function has a bunch of these stretchy buff pushes and similarly yeah so the statement blocks and blah 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 all of that stuff so um yeah let's get rid of that let's let's try to use a different allocation approach just to see that number go to zero um you know roughly 30 percent of cpu time for that is uh, you know i for, for, if you're used to doing optimization, 30%, I mean, it's it's not as much as when we went from quadratic time to linear time, but that's still a big honking, uh, you know, pineapple hanging on the tree waiting for us to pick. All right. Um, so right now, those those functions we're, we're calling buff push directly, and we're using sort of, um, you know, stretchy buff dynamic array functionality. And you will recall that the way that stuff works is we call this buff fit function uh, to ensure we have enough capacity and if we don't have enough capacity to accommodate the extra push then we call this grow function this grow function ultimately calls into malloc or realloc in these two cases um, and so just l l let's b before we do anything else let's be extremely sloppy um, and just see what would it look like if we had if, if we had a, a really good allocator and so let's not worry about deallocation or whatever or stack allocation. Let's just use a big arena that's just sort of like a garbage dump, just in, in order to, and, and, and not even an arena, let's just use a big static buffer just to see what happens if um, if we do this. Uh, like, so if we can basically, if we can drive this thing close to zero by using just a big buffer and using a, you know, arena style bump pointer to um, to store stuff. And so let's say this is like, gosh, I don't know. Let's say 16 megabytes, I don't know. And actually, let's just call this, let, let's move this out a little bit from the buffer stuff. Um, So this is 16 megabytes. Okay. And so let's do a temp allocation. And um, basically we're just going to return Well, um, let's see, we let's see, we do eight byte alignment. Um, let me think. It would be nice if we could just um, okay, let me. This is a little bit of a weird way of doing it, but let's um, let's do something like this. Um, Okay, um, and so this is going to be a it's going to be eight byte aligned initially because this is a this this sixty four bit thing requires natural alignment, which is eight bytes for it. Um, all right, and then let's say so here we can assume this pointer is originally allocated, uh, and then we need to update it. Um, 
well, let's say if um, new temp storage pointer, um, let's say this is, uh, what is it, a line up putter, what did I call it? Oh, yeah, a line up putter. Uh, a line up putter, um, putter, and then temp alloc line. Um, and then new temp storage footers, I guess, greater than or equal to this. Um, temp storage allocation overflow or ran out of temp storage. Um, otherwise, you return this and you set, well, I guess I can just set it directly since it's a fatal error. So you set it, you set it like this, and you add this. When I have, oh, right. Um, so let's say uh, assert pointer is equal to align down pointer temp alloc align update this to the next thing taking into account alignment um, check for an overrun actually that that's not the right way to do it. Um, I should do it like this to prevent. I mean, this is a little bit of a nitpick thing, but um, if I do pointer plus size, um, I'm not allowed to point off the end of the array according to C. So I have to do it like this, uh, or it has to be greater than, I guess. So we have to be equal to. Um, I think something like this. Should probably be here so we can use it everywhere. Okay. And so let's just be really um Okay, and let's maybe also just to slot in very easily, let's do a temp re well temp realloc. Yeah, you have to know the old size, so I don't want to to do that. Um, okay, let's do it this way. And before we do that, let's try to do what I tried to do yesterday and apparently failed because the whole thing crashed. Um, but let's first get rid of the realloc just using malloc. So um, let's first say, um, let's allocate the new header. If we have an existing buffer, then we have to copy over. Um, let's see, what do we have to copy over? We have to copy over um, we have to copy over oops um, we have to copy over the old data, and so that would be. Um, buff len. I guess not just from buff actually. Um, this has to be multiplied by the element size. 
And we also have to copy over the length from the old buffer. No, I guess that's right. So get the header. Oh, we don't need the header actually. Um, copy over the length, copy over the old data. Otherwise, um, we just have to make sure that this new header is set to zero. Um, and then in either case, we set the new capacity. And I think we also have to make sure, do we actually do any buffer free right now? Let's just remove that. Well, actually let's not remove it. Let's just, let's have the same behavior in terms of nulling out the pointer. But um, let's not actually do the freeing. Um, let's see if that actually works. Okay, so um, what did we? What was the thing we were actually testing? Was that just the parser? I think it was, right? So yeah, that was just the parser. Um, since the error I introduced last night was from the rest of the pipeline, let's run the rest of the pipeline to make sure that um, the data we actually put put in those stretchy buffs didn't get corrupted or anything weird. Okay, sounds reasonable. Let's just eyeball it or uh, the C file. Yeah, that looks reasonable. Looks reasonable. Um, let's go back to the parser though. Okay, so now that we have this structure, let's um, let's change it to this using the temp allocator. Let's see if this works. Okay, so I guess, yeah, we have a really, I mean, I don't know. I don't know how, how large it will let me make this static buffer. Um, okay, well, we can just allocate it. We can allocate it. Uh, a different way. Um, So this should still run out. Yeah. But now we can make it really large, like a gigabyte. <clears throat> um let me just make sure that code didn't break totally. Uh so the the first time through we allocate one gigabyte buffer. All right. Um, what are we doing on time? All right. Let's let's do the profiling. See if that actually helped or not. So it was thirty percent before malloc. And that disappeared. Although I can't remember, but let's just put it back again. Um, and let me do a profile run with this stuff. OK, 
can actually diff the reports, I think, um, which I don't remember using, but maybe that, this will be a good occasion. Right, so it says 1.7, so I don't know if it actually helped in total terms. Or it, yeah, this is not really moving the needle, to be honest. Um, it's possible this was... So this might not really matter. It's interesting. I wonder if the reason, it's possible the time it's ascribing to the system malloc is actually just because it's touching the memory and so all the cache misses are actually being ascribed to that function, but it's not really the, the fact that the allocator is slow per se, which would maybe make sense. Because if you, so this was the, the report with the system allocator, um, and this is the report now. Um, and it's supposed to be on the same, I mean, maybe let's do some other runs, but you can see that the total CPU time stays about the same. It's a little bit faster with our temp allocator, um, but the existing functions that were, you know, they were near the top, now take up more time than before. I don't know why next token would suddenly take up more time though. That's not a function I would expect to have anything to do with that memory. Um, let me try to do some multiple runs here. This might have, might have ended up being a wild goose chase. Um, let's see, okay, let's let's do another profile run of this. With the system allocator and let's do another one of the original or a couple Okay, it's interesting. I'm not sure why those things are getting uh, allocated to those lines all of a sudden. Um, but anyway, let's now try this. Do a couple of those just to see if, if that result was consistent. So yeah, this is around the same total time, but again, more time is being ascribed to next token than before by quite a margin as well. Like 900 milliseconds versus, I guess 700 is not that big a difference. Um, let's just do another just to make sure it wasn't a freak accident. Yeah, that's interesting. That is pretty interesting. All right. Um, my guess is that the, again, my guess is that, so you can see that the total CPU time, I mean, granted we're running under the profiler, but 1.7 seconds is about what I timed it to manually when I ran it from the command line. Um, so it's within the spitting distance of what I would expect. So the I don't think there's too much of a probe effect from running it under the profiler. And you can see that the malloc bucket completely disappears. Um, but now these functions, and, and note that none of these functions were calling malloc. So it's not like that just got reassigned to it. Um, like that they are now doing work, like they're touching memory that was previously touched by malloc so that, uh, yeah. All right. Um, I'm not sure exactly what's going on there. I mean, given that the total time hasn't really improved by more than a tiny fraction, uh, it definitely is, I'm, I'm not going to keep this up, I'm not going to keep this in, I'm going to revert that. But um, I'm curious why 
the profile buckets are moving around like this because again if it was a it was if it was one of these functions that i know is responsible for a lot of the calls to buff push then i might just say okay it's the problem was really the memory being touched and now that memory is being touched by someone else but it still has to be touched and so it just moves the time to someone else uh, else's bucket but it doesn't really improve the total time i could understand but i don't understand why the time is getting reassigned to these guys um anyway that might be a good stopping point so uh hopefully i explained some of the optimization stuff but you can also see here how you can be uh you can end up wasting some time trying to optimize what seems like a 30% easy win that apparently doesn't pan out. Although it may turn out it pans out and I just did something stupid, but uh, I will have to go poke my resident optimization experts like Fabian to uh, give me some idea of why the time might have moved around like that. Um, anyway, let's do some Q&A and then I'll, I'll shut off the stream. Someone's uh, someone's saying, aren't the profile buckets relative time? No, they're. I'm I'm looking at the milliseconds. Um, I'm looking at the numbers. So in this case, it's saying roughly one second in next token. Uh, under you know, well under next token. So you can go and look at it. Um, and, yeah, and a lot of this is well. A lot of this is the total time, not the exclusive time. I guess I should make that clear. Well, actually, let's look at the exclusive because that's probably more representative. So here was, let's see here. So this was with a malloc. So there was 230, 240 milliseconds of exclusive time for next uh, token. And here we have, yeah, roughly this little bit more now, but not that much, but a whole lot more. I guess, so maybe it's the string range. Yeah, so stir range is roughly 30% more. I'll have to look at this in more detail, but, but the bottom line is that the total CPU time didn't really move substantially, like by less than a percent or something like, yeah, less than a percent, which is ultimately what you care about. So I'm mostly just trying to figure out why, um, Anyway, I'll, I'll look at that later. Yeah, so the, the temp allocator is just, uh, I mean, this was not uh, intended to be a permanent temp allocator. It was basically intended to be something that would show what it might look like if you were just doing, you know, like if you just have a huge block of memory and you're just bumping it through it, which incidentally isn't the optimal thing because this even though it doesn't have a lot of memory overhead, and in theory it's all kind of prefetchable because it's all linear bump stuff, um, it's not really a stack allocator where in theory you could use a small part of memory repeatedly with a stack allocator. This is just a, a bump allocator. But yeah, um, so it's possible a stack allocator would be a bigger win, but I, I was expecting to see this go down substantially and I'm surprised to see it not move at all. Um, all right, let's see what else people said. Yeah, someone's saying STB sprint F time with regard to the uh, the other stuff. I mean, we don't we don't need to sprint F. We just need like because all we're doing with sprint F, except for maybe one isolated case. No, I think not even that. Um, I guess when we're actually printing floats, we're using it. But other than that, and then maybe ints, right? But like we're almost never using it like that. We're just doing string concatenation, so we don't really need sprint F. It's just a convenience, and it would be easy just to get rid of it for that use case. Um, anyway. All right. Yeah, I think I'm going to go bug Fabian after the stream about this, uh, this profile report. I'm pretty sure it's something obvious that I'm just misreading about it. But uh, ultimately what matters is did it make the whole thing go faster? And the answer is not enough to account for 30%, right? Like it looked like 30% could be killed there, but we killed less than 1%.
Um, all right. Well, if, uh, let me see if there's any other questions, and then we'll we'll shut off the stream for today. So today was mostly just a walkthrough of stuff. Since people had brought up a bunch of questions after the extra stream from last time, I wanted to make sure that we covered that material in the mainstream. Um, so I'm, I'm kind of that was my main purpose of today. But I was hoping to get in this kind of easy 20, 30 percent optimization, but which is not really panning out. Oh, someone's asking about the other profiler. I don't think the other profiler is going to tell. I mean, this is just a basic sampling profiler. I mean, I could use VTune to get more information about the cache misses and stuff. I don't know if uh, you can get that through. I mean, I can try it, but I. The existing profiler we were using was already sampling based, I believe. Um, but all right. Let's see if this does something useful. I think all of the profilers in Visual Studio lean on uh, Windows's ETW. Uh, event tracing for Windows functionality. I, I wrote a profiler myself that uses that before, and uh, I don't think any of them have their own stuff. It's basically just because this is a pretty low sampling rate um, because this is for a 1.7 second run, but uh, let's see here. Well, this might be another good thing to optimize because I, yeah, it's, I, I, this is another thing I was playing on optimizing at some point. But right now, it's spending a lot of time. Well, here's the, it's describing this to the switch. This is presumably just like branch, like the the, the jump table uh, work, and it's describing a lot of time to this. But probably that's just because the fraction of white space to non-white space in a file is pretty substantial, and so even if this was totally free, it still has to step over it, and it's probably accounting for a good fraction of the time. But it's worth replacing these built-in C functions with something faster, um, which I might do if I get bored. Um, but yeah, most of this time is ultimately because of the string interning by a large margin. But yeah, this I mean this takes a good amount of time as well. Um, but but stuff like this time here, I mean, this could just be touching the memory at all and doing something. But um, I know that is alnum and is space and those things are actually function calls rather than you know intrinsics or macros or something like that. So it's and they're not getting in line. So it's entirely possible we'll get a nice little boost from uh, replacing those by uh, some custom logic, like maybe a a simple lookup table or something. But yeah, I mean, this is consistent with what I was getting from the other profiler. I think it's using the same profiling, profiling method. <clears throat> Someone's asking if we will do direct code generation now, or will we wait until we have a CPU to target? Yeah, we'll wait until we have a CPU to target. Um, there's no point in doing it now. I don't know what you mean by someone's asking why I ask. Okay, let me see what the original question was. Oh, is the is the eventual plan to write an Ion compiler in Ion? Um, yes, I mean eventually, but that will be pretty far down the line. So for the for a long time, it will just be used as a cross compiler, and then eventually, when it makes sense, when there's enough other operating system features and standard library features available on the target platform. We will basically do a mostly automated transformation from C. Some stuff obviously is harder to automate, but a lot of it will be automatable in the translation um, with some manual work as well. Um, and then it will be self hosting, but that's much further down the line. It only makes sense to do that once the system is kind of built up enough that it's usable as a personal computer, because otherwise you wouldn't want to run the compiler on it anyway. 
Um, if it's a, it, once it's still a small scale system, you would only want to do cross compilation anyway, because the system itself would be too anemic to host a compiler in any useful way. Um, uh, any chance make ion func call return more than one value in the future when C backend no longer needed? The C backend is always going to be needed, so it's never going to disappear. It's not just for bootstrapping. Um, so we're never going to seriously, like the, the things that will deviate from things that are easy to do with C are things that are only intended to be used for risk five. Like there will be inline assembly just for risk five, and there will be intrinsics that are risk or not just risk five specifics, but, but specific to whatever uh, systems we're targeting. Uh, like not just the instruction set, but maybe instruction set extensions we make ourselves or uh, or other low level things like that. So those sorts of things will not have corresponding C counterparts. Like I'm not going to do inline assembly for the C backend because th that's not really portable, right? Like every GCC uh, inline assembly is totally different from MSVC. Actually, MSVC doesn't even have 64-bit inline assembly, so it wouldn't be re reasonable to do that. But like we will have eventually inline assembly for the RISC-V backend, but that obviously will be totally non-portable, so it's not really an issue in the first place. But uh, I'm not going to change semantics in a way, like for, for core semantics, I'm not going to change it in a way that completely breaks the ability to generate reasonable C code. Multiple return values, you could just do you could do while retaining some level of C compatibility by just generating, you know, like a struct return value that is then unpacked in the C code. But if we ever do that, it will be far down the line. For the first couple of versions, I'm trying to stick very close to C because C is fine. Like there's there's no there's no there's no plan to try to solve all kinds of usability problems with C. It's mostly just trying to stick to C semantics. Um Someone's asking, is the ion compiler going to be modified to take multiple files? Yes, it's go the way the packeting system works is that because uh, uh, declarations are order independent, you can simply take, say, all the files in the current directory that have an ion extension um, and consider them part of the same package. So that's how it's going to work. How am I going to handle things like directories for multiple platforms? Yeah, so I mean, unfortunately, uh, the C standard library doesn't support directory operations. So you need to do something slightly different. Like POSIX has one way. So I will probably need to do a little bit of a platform wrapper that does Windows stuff in one way and POSIX stuff in another way. But uh, I won't try to do like a full directory uh, abstraction layer. I will just do, you know, make a like generate a list of, of all files with a given extension in the current directory or something like that. Or maybe even just generate a list of all files in the current directory as an array, and then return that, and you can filter it yourself in some generic way. Um, but, but there's no plan to do like a fancy platform abstraction layer for directories. So just like do a simple function to return a list of files in a given directory. Um, someone was also saying about malloc that it just gets the pages from the OS, but doesn't really do anything with them. Um, yeah. I actually, I mean, it depends on the OS, what the, like, the or not not just the OS, but like, if you use malloc in uh, an MSVC, it ultimately calls, what is it, the RTL heap, which mostly hits what, what Windows calls the, the low fragmentation heap, I think. I mean, it depends on the allocation sizes and stuff like that. But I actually don't know exactly what they touch or don't touch in terms of the memory they get back from the OS. Um, so yeah, I'm not 100% sure. Like, I mean, I, if I wanted, I could totally, uh, this wouldn't be portable, but I mean, I could totally, whatever, temp alloc, I could totally, I, I could do like virtual alloc, right? <clears throat> and get it directly from the OS, but that wouldn't be portable. But, but, but in any case, I don't, yeah. This shouldn't really be a big issue because when you get back a, a gigabyte of memory, like we could see that getting the gigabyte itself, like that operation didn't show up in the profile. Um, and so presumably anything that's done with the memory after that would just be, you know, you're touching the memory for the first time. It's going to be cold, um, probably, unless it can be prefetched because we're accessing it linearly. But yeah, I'm not sure. All right. 
I think we're coming up to the end. Uh, today we didn't get a lot of coding done, but uh, we got a bunch of explaining done. Hopefully that was useful to folks. Um, next week I am, and over the weekend, my wife's uh, my wife's out of town for a week, so I have a lot of time to just focus on programming. Um, and so next week for me is going to be a little bit crunch time because I really want to finish version zero by next weekend. And so my plan for next week is basically like the, the one remaining design thing that's been haunting me is uh, is something I've kind of decided on now. And so I'm going to start hammering on that hard, um, probably not today, but uh, over the weekend and, and through next week. And so uh, like it, it may not happen, but I'm setting myself sort of an internal deadline that by end of next week, or at least over next weekend, I want to basically have something that's totally usable where you know, it may not catch every single warning that GCC or MSVC will warn about on the C side, but at least the C, the C semantics, uh, if not all the warnings, will be properly accounted for. And I'm going to be pretty systematic uh, going through that and, and uh, validating it. And I'm going to, I, I, I was consulting um, the LCC book to make sure that I'm handling, that, that was, that, that, that's not for C99, that's for, I guess, C89, ANSI C early ANSI C, but kind of was looking through that to make sure that I'm handling uh, that stuff in a way that's consistent with C. Uh, and so that's my focus for next week is really hammering on that. Um, but anyway, yeah, so uh, hey everyone have a good weekend. And um, uh, next week, a lot of stuff should be coming together. I mean, we already have the end-to-end -end flow, but uh, all the stuff in the type checker is still, uh, so a lot of it needs to be expanded and, and refactored in order to uh, be kind of more production ready. So that's going to be my major focus uh, starting the week this weekend and, and over next week. So uh, see everyone next week.